Jonathan Kuskiski with the Excel program here at the University of Michigan School of Music, Theater, and Dance. And today my guest is Jade Simmons. Welcome, it's great to have you here. Thank you for having me. And Jade is a classical pianist, concert pianist, a powerhouse speaker, an emergence expert, and a bunch of other things I couldn't fit <laughs> <Yeah>. on the screen. <laughs> uh, so, and we'll get to that in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, you're here for several days working with our students. Right. And one of the things you're gonna talk about with them is this idea of sort of uncommon career building. Sure. And so let's start with yours. You certainly yeah. have an uncommon career, <laughs> if you might, uh, if you will. So what are some of the things that go into that sort of mm -hmm. career at, at present? Well, you know, I went to school for piano performance. Mm -hmm. And if I'm being honest, the only thing I ever wanted to do was play, you know, Chopin, Beethoven, Rachmaninoff. Um, and I had a wonderful undergraduate education at Northwestern, went mm -hmm. on to do my grad at Rice University in Houston. And when I got out of school, you know, it kind of hits you, because this was really before kind of the wave and the trend of really mm -hmm. developing uh, music business and, and career preparation mm -hmm. pieces really uh, was, was on trend. So when I got out, I realized very quickly that everybody, <laughs> everybody could play well, <laughs> fabulously even. Um, and so it hits you really quickly, how am I gonna make my mark? Mm -hmm. And it sure does look like it's not just practice that makes <laughs> perfect, and it sure does look like not just the cream rises to the top. Everybody's awesome, everybody's cream. And so my career started perform uh, with merely just performing. And that was enough for a little while. Mm -hmm. Um, I would program these really big concerts, and in order to get through them, I started talking to the audience mm -hmm. about the music, about my thoughts on the music, about what I wanted them to feel, and that started to feel really good. Mm. Not just for me, but I realized later that for the audience, because they were coming mm. for one thing and being impacted doubly. Mm. Um, in a matter of twists and terms, I ended up going into professional speaking as well, mm. being asked just to come in and speak, and today I speak to major companies and corporations about creativity and innovation. I bring my piano with me. <laughs> really? Uh, yeah, yeah. And so as I speak, I use instances of music, classical music, um, wow. some avant-garde music, original music, to drive home the points that I'm making. And what's so wonderful is that these outside industries mm -hmm. really appreciate what an artist brings to the table about creativity and innovation because we live it. We yeah. live that experience. And then. Um, since then, I've also gone on to author some books, one for emerging artists, hence the title emerging, Emergence Expert. Mm -hmm. And I'm also today uh, operating and functioning as a minister. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, my faith has always been important to me. And music, to me, even classical music was kind of a form of worship. Mm -hmm. And so to now be able to speak very openly mm -hmm. about how my faith impacts every area of my life has been mm -hmm just a really wonderful full circle moment. So wow. that's a few of the things in a nutshell. So you're very busy. <laughs> I am busy. So can I ask a just quick follow up? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, uh, we've had, this is a 30 something episode. Sure. And one of the interesting things that we see from the artists that we talk to from all different backgrounds and different disciplines mm -hmm. is that this idea of a portfolio career is more real than maybe it has ever been. Mm. Um, and so how do you juggle that? I mean, you know, especially as, man, I think about, you know, touring or traveling to these talks with your piano, sure. just finding the time to practice, that yeah. kind of, you know, those nuts and bolts things. Mm -hmm. How do you, do you have a system for managing your time? How, how do you do it? You know, I, I'm also married and I have two kids. Mm -hmm. So systems are important, but if I'm being honest, I don't always get to stick to the systems. So what I'm learning is to kind of live in seasons and mm -hmm. to be a little bit better with how I plan my time far out. Early on when I was just performing, you know, your year is kind of booked a year mm -hmm. in advance. And if you're not careful, you miss the present. You mm -hmm. just miss it because you're always preparing for something that's months away. Yeah. So now in order to be a mom that's present and a wife mm -hmm. that is present, um, I have seasons where I'm solely preparing for something. Other seasons where I call that my kind of seed planning season. Mm -hmm. Other seasons where it's the harvest, where I'm mm -hmm. out, they know mommy's gonna be traveling. Uh, wife may not be doing as many of the domestic things as I <laughs> can do when mm -hmm. I'm home. And pre preparation and practice take priority. Um, and I'm finding that any artist, any solopreneur, has to have a support system that <laughs> understands what it's like to have your mind constantly filled with creating things. Um, and it's a balance you kind of learn over time. So how does, I love the term solopreneur. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And so, and I think you know, I'm, as a pianist, I think about that a lot too. I mean, if you, especially if your you know primary discipline, the thing that you kind of got into the arts, um, you know, with that passion, happens to be, say, a solo instrument mm -hmm. or an instrument that primarily is solo, you would get used to doing things in isolation. You do. And you develop a certain discipline and and uh, you know focus in working in, in isolation. Mm -hmm. But you already hit on this importance. No matter whether you, you know, no matter what kind of uh, art you're pursuing, that you need a team, you need collaboration. And so, how does that work for you? I mean, I mean, do you have sort of uh, do you have sort of a formalized support structure and then an mm -hmm. informal group of people that you kind of your circle, so to speak? Sure. Or how does that work? You know, if I'm again being very honest, which I think it's important mm -hmm. for artists who have successful careers to be honest about mm -hmm. what didn't work, it took me years to understand that mm -hmm. I couldn't do everything by myself. It took me years uh, mm -hmm. to be able to accept that. And what I realized is that if you're serious about a big vision. Mm -hmm. There's going to come a point where it's going to take more than you to birth the vision. And so when I was performing, mm -hmm. I didn't really need that much of a system. Mm -hmm. I needed maybe an assistant to help with bookings. Uh, there were times when I had managers and agents or record labels and they would handle certain things. Um, the hard part of that is you realize even when you get an agent, because there's a myth that mm -hmm. when you get your manager, they're going to do everything for you. Nobody can talk about how you do your art the way that you talk about it. So even when you have a partner in crime, you're really doing a lot of the legwork mm -hmm. and the groundwork in terms of establishing how the world's going to come to mm -hmm. know you as an artist. Um, over time, my vision of what I wanted for my career changed. I no longer wanted to be a freelancer. I hated the mm -hmm. idea that I was not going to be able to practice my art, perform, and pay my bills mm -hmm. unless some presenter felt like booking me. Mm -hmm. I hated that if personnel changed at a venue that I'd played for years, I may not get a booking that mm -hmm. year. And I thought, this just can't be the only way to exist in the world of art. Mm -hmm. And so I remember there was literally a day when I decided I'm no longer freelancing. I'm going to be the boss <laughs> of my art. And I started running myself like a company. Mm. And so today there are divisions of <laughs> that company. You know, there's a publishing division. I have a record label. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have a, engagements and media. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now I'm building out, uh, you know, a real concrete team. I have someone who handles social media mm -hmm. and content redistribution and creation. Mm -hmm. For me, uh, and I have an assistant who does a lot of the bookings mm -hmm. and logistics. That's great. Well, okay, let's talk. So you have a lot of momentum as well because you have, momentum. and um, and le so I'd like to kind of continue the conversation, talking about sort of a moment or a period there um, where you know your philosophy evolves. Mm -hmm. You've talked about it a little bit already, going from you know, and I think many musicians and th performing artists of all types can talk about this need to sort of impress and to focus yeah. on the performance, and how that changed into a focus on impact. Can you talk a little bit about about what that, how that process worked for you and you know, what the transition was. It was an unwilling transition if, I'm, if I really w think about it. Because I, I had bought into the concept that if I just played my butt off, mm -hmm. I would get all the bookings in the world, I would you know, make the kind of income that I needed to make. And that's kind of a rude awakening, as mm. I said earlier. And I remember kind of being on stage and playing these, I call them samurai recitals, mm -hmm. where I would only program the biggest, you know, blockbuster classical mm -hmm. hits. I think also as an African-American female pianist who didn't see herself replicated in the industry, mm -hmm. there was an internal need to kind of prove something. Mm -hmm. So I was playing all these big pieces, sweating through my <laughs> gowns. I was not smiling or engaging mm -hmm. with the audience because I was serious and classical was serious. And um, it was really not fun. Mm -hmm. It was not fun because I would make one mistake or wait, make one slip and as I'm playing I would imagine all oh, my career is over, mm -hmm. there's a critic in the front row and the front page is yeah. going to have a headline saying she sucked and you know yeah. you it's just so unhealthy yeah. and I realized I spent all my life learning this craft why am I not enjoying it mm -hmm. um, and there is a I'm a competitive person I think many musicians are competitive especially in the music school setting but I realized I, if I was going to just go in the mode of competition, mm -hmm. I was going to be competing against the people who weren't even on the stage, the prodigies, the yeah. legends, who just like I always say, won't even die. They're like 100 <laughs> years old, still yeah, recording, yeah. you yeah. know? Um, and it, I had to say, if I'm doing this, why am I here? Mm -hmm. And so I had to make this shift from merely impressing the audience, which mm -hmm. was how fast I could play, how loud I could play, how uh, articulately I could you know, do dynamics. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and I said, what else do I have to offer? Mm -hmm. Can I move them? 
to hear things differently. And so when I started telling these stories, mm -hmm. people would say afterwards, you know, I mean, that Chopin was really wonderful. But the story you told about the Chopin made me remember this. And at first I was offended by it because I thought, didn't you hear how wonderful that coda was? <laughs> what are you talking about and the story for? Yes, yeah, did yeah. you see me get through that and beat yeah. the heck out of that piano? And I couldn't, I wasn't mature enough to understand they were saying, Jade, we came for one reason mm -hmm. and we left impacted another way. Mm. When you get a hold of that, it's so addictive to mm. know that you can move an audience to tears or you can make them remember something important or activate something in them um, that makes them want to go out and mm -hmm. reach a new level. When you start behaving that way as an mm -hmm. artist, the things like missed notes or memory slips, um, you know, you still want to play excellently, mm -hmm. but they, they go into the background mm -hmm. and your foreground becomes, can I, impact people in a way that goes beyond the concert hall. Wow. Mm. So that's, it takes a lot of courage to go through that process, I think. Yeah. It's, it seems like a very, I can imagine it being a very scary process, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're starting to reevaluate not just what the impact could be, which I can see that being exciting, but it comes with a total reevaluation of what that means for you oh, and the yeah. work that you're going to do. So yeah. what changed, I mean, you, you now obviously you do all sorts of different things, mm -hmm. but what were some of the first things that you changed in terms of how you approached yeah. with this change in philosophy, you approached the work that you were going to do? I'll tell you what, it has been a series of risk-taking. Mm -hmm. um, if I had to give myself another title, it would be chronic reinventionist. <laughs> <laughs> and I love living this way. Mm -hmm. It's like almost every six to eight months, I add something new to the mm -hmm. arsenal. I shed some other skin and become a heightened version of who mm -hmm. I was last year or six months ago. And I really think that's evolution. Mm -hmm. I think that is the highest form of evolution. And so the first thing I did is I added the storytelling. And like I said, mm -hmm. there's something addictive because you, you go, oh my God, the audience is listening in a different way. Mm -hmm. What else can I introduce? Mm -hmm. And you start saying, I love Chopin, I love Beethoven, but am I being all of myself right now? Mm -hmm. Truth was, I was listening to all sorts of mu music mm -hmm. outside of the concert hall. I got curious as to how much could I, how much adventure could I bring into the hall? And over time I started, um, this came much later, but I, would, I was playing more modern classical. That was kind of the first mm -hmm. um, iteration. And then, uh, that's a whole other world of classical music. Right. You know, there's a whole scene for that. I met some incredible uh, composers. John Curliano has been a great advocate of mine. Tanya Leon, a Cuban composer. Um, you know, they were like a mother and a papa, mm -hmm. you know, to me musically. And then I said, okay, there's new audiences here that I didn't see in the concert hall. Mm -hmm. um, how colorful could my audiences <laughs> get? Because again, as an African American, I wasn't seeing myself in the seats. Yeah. Um, as a 20 something at the time, I wasn't seeing any other 20 year olds in the seat. Right. Um, so I started just stretching the boundaries in terms of what kind of music. I started introducing electronics to all the way to day where uh, most of my concerts go from Rachmaninoff to rap, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been exciting because the more I change, the mm -hmm. more the audience changes with me. And it's Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just as a s sort of a question that's coming up as you're saying all this, and so mm -hmm. you know, so one of the things you changed right away seems like a relatively minor change in mm -hmm. that you started to talk, but that could be a huge, huge. hindrance, right? Yeah. I know many uh, many <laughs> people who feel much more feel much more comfortable preparing that hours worth of Brahms or Shakespeare or a cho choreography than they would ten minutes speaking in front of an audience. Mm -hmm. And so, and obviously, you have now this whole other platform where you do you do sort of uh, talks and you know s you do. S uh, speeches mm -hmm. and you talk at conferences and so forth and work with companies uh, to inspire them and help cultivate creativity. So was that something you always felt like, you know, a skill that you had? I mean, what are the skills mm -hmm. as you w went along this evolution, um, reinvention, if you will, um, of your of your craft and your brand mm -hmm. that you felt like, okay, I have these certain skills with me, but these are the ones I have to lean in on. Yeah. Which yeah. were the ones you had to lean in on? That's a great question. I think the first thing an artist has to do, especially when they're at that cusp of leaving the school environment, is do a very serious reassessment. Mm. Because what happens is when you get in the environment, especially of music school, uh, you become very, it's, it's kind of a micro mm -hmm. uh, cosm. You're, you're very focused and you forget you know how to do other things. Mm -hmm. So over the course of four years or six years or eight years, you begin to believe that the only thing you know how to do is play the piano. Mm -hmm. You forget you know how to speak. <laughs> you forget you know how to write. You forget you know how to connect and you must do those things. Mm -hmm. You must be a great writer because you need to be able to write about what you do effectively. Mm -hmm. That's how you get booked. Mm -hmm. um, you need to be 
at least a comfortable speaker mm -hmm. because audiences love the moment when you go as I've heard people say over the, across the footlights mm -hmm. it's so unexpected you think talking is a minor thing mm -hmm. but especially in classical music even 10 years ago <gasps> it was like oh my gosh she's talking mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a big deal and that actually catapulted my career early mm -hmm. on I went from once I started talking I was in a different level mm -hmm. than the people I was competing against when I was just playing mm -hmm. um, and speaking for me was a natural skill. Mm -hmm. I just hadn't thought to combine it mm -hmm. with this thing I was so focused on. Mm -hmm. So speaking, connecting, writing is definitely important. Uh, being able to talk about yourself in a way that displays a confidence mm -hmm. in what you do, uh, but that doesn't come off as people say, you know, like you're self-promoting too much. But we have to get over the fear of that mm -hmm. because the market is so saturated, you have to know how to talk about what you do and about how you do it. Um, and then finally, I would say just having the willingness to try new things, <laughs> to really try new things, but it's not a gimmick. And I think we can see that, right? You see when an sure, artist yep. puts on a gimmick, and Absolutely. I think that is what makes people roll their eyes when they go, mm -hmm. oh, she's a, you know, a pianist and a speaker and an author. Oh, what, let's see, mm -hmm. because they assume that must mean the person is flaky. Yeah. Um, but what I really believe is that if you can take the risk of just becoming more of yourself, Mm -hmm. Over time, every little slash that you're adding has always been there. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you the things you have to lean into for a lot of artists that are hard is learning how to negotiate, mm -hmm. um, learning how to ask for more money. It's kind of a taboo topic. Yes, um, indeed. But um, many artists never emerge and give up on their talent and on the, on the dream of performing because it's not sustainable financially. Can I ask a quick question on that? So, And I totally see that with, our, with students and mm -hmm. young professionals in general. That, and it's something because you never negotiate. I mean, you know, you practice uh, 10,000 hours, so you feel comfortable with that. You know, you have your first negotiation mm -hmm. e encounter and it's like, oh, I'm at a huge disadvantage. Mm -hmm. So do you find that cultivating this sort of sense of being more of who you are, in other words, defining this really yeah. authentic brand helps you negotiate? I mean, was that in your case, did making these changes and kind of the momentum that came with it, did that help you in your negotiation? Not necessarily just because of the, you know, you, you, know, you had more brand, mm -hmm. but because you were able to more effectively communicate why you were worth the money? What you're talking about is the worth. Yeah. Understanding your worth. And I don't mean that in kind of the self-helpy way of we're all just worth everything and you know yeah. we deserve everything. It's, it's not as simplistic as that, but it's very specific mm -hmm. in if I'm now gonna come to your hall and not just play a concert for two hours and leave, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna communicate with your audience, I might do a pre-concert talk, um, you find out, hey, she's great with kids as well. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going from a Thursday night concert to going into a school on a Friday. Mm -hmm. You find out she can also speak to a college audience, so she's gonna stay some more hours and speak at a university and do a career seminar. You're adding value to mm -hmm. your engagement, which is goodwill for the presenter. Right. Because if University of Michigan takes me out into the school systems, or uh, and takes me in Ann Arbor, or takes me in Detroit, it looks good for the University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. So now the bottom line, what I would ask that university to pay me can be much higher mm -hmm. than what I would ask for if I were simply coming into play. <laughs> so you're adding value, and the reason I say you have to know how to write and talk is so that you can talk about the package mm -hmm. that you're bringing in. This is something that I think most artists never have the chance to really think about, mm -hmm. and they assume they're limited, uh, in piano's case, you know, to the 88 keys. But really, the impact begins beyond the concert hall. Mm -hmm. um, and the impact is where the worth comes in, and the worth is where the added income comes mm -hmm. in as well. That's great. Well, yeah. and I love how you frame this outwardly. So, you know, in other words, defining this sort of package is mm -hmm. helpful for the artist, but it's actually helpful for the presenter or whoever is going to be booking yeah. you because it's a potential platform for them to reach new audiences yeah. and to it's enhance goodwill. their reach. Absolutely. That's right. um, well, it's been such a pleasure to have you, to talk with you today. Oh, our time's up already. And, wow. And I, well, and I mean, wish we had more, but I also look forward to seeing you, you know, working with our students and all the things you're going to do here on campus. Uh, it's just great to have you here. So thank, thank you so much. much.